All right, let's bow our heads in prayer. Father God, I thank you for another wonderful day that you've given us. And Lord, I thank you for this message you've laid on my heart. Lord, I thank you that it will go forth and it will prosper where into it's sent. And I thank you set a watch before my mouth. Keep the door on my lips, Lord. Thank you to open my mouth wide. You'll fill it and that you'll help me see say this in your spirit, in your heart, Lord. And that will find root in people and it will bear much fruit in their lives, Lord. In my life too. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. When you face the storms in your life, how do you react? Do you let fear overcome you? Do you lose all your peace and then you run to the world? Or do you call out to God and seek him till you find your peace and you get your breakthrough and your instructions? Because how you react to the storms, the trials and the tribulations of your life will either make or break you. Your reactions will cause you to come through them whole and victorious or to stumble through them, broken and shattered. You'll either end up like David, who God rescued time after time and raised him up above his enemies and difficulties and delivered him, or you'll end up like King Saul, who ended up turning away from God and to the world to find his solutions. To start this, we're going to read of King Saul when he was facing the Philistine army in 1 Samuel 13. This is his first act of disobedience, and his disobedience opens the door for the devil to come in and destroy him, to wreak havoc in his life. We also need to look at that in our lives. Are our decisions opening the door for the devil? Is our disobedience giving him place in our lives to wreak havoc? Jesus said in John 14, verse 30, Hereafter I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me. The prince Jesus is talking about is Satan, and, and it says in the Amplified Version, and he, Satan, has no claim on me, Jesus, no power over me, nor anything that he can use against me. Many times, if we would closely examine ourselves and our lives, we will find that there are things that the devil can use against us, such as our short tempers, our pride, our love of entertainment, our habit of turning to food for comfort, what we let in our eye gates and our ear gates, our desire and greed for physical items or for relationships or how easily we get offended by people or even the everyday decisions we make. My father over 20 years ago opened the door for the devil by buying a piece of land even though initially God told him no, but he kept on asking until God with a heavy heart said, go ahead. So dad built the house on that land and that action Open the door for the enemy to come in and wreak havoc. My little sister got hurt. The church ended up going through a split and it started falling apart. My mom and dad then went through years of extreme marital hardship. And this all stemmed from dad's decisions. And this holds true for all of us. There was a time I was obese and that happened because I was eating the wrong types of food and I was eating way too much of them. We're talking ramen noodles, cheesy bread on white, white bread with sandwiches and potato chips and junk food. And if I had continued down that path and refused to say, okay, this is a problem in my life. I am opening the door for destruction. I'm tired of being like this. If I had continued that way, it would have opened the door for all kinds of health problems, potentially diabetes and all kinds of other difficulties in my life. But through God's strength, he helped me step by step, and it took several years to get the weight off in a healthy way and to keep it off. And so many of us, we do have places in our lives, and we are opening the door for disease, for our destruction and strife because of our everyday choices and how we're responding and reacting to our lives. So we need to make sure that we humble ourselves and go to God and inquire of him and obey him when he tells us what to do and call unto him for grace and strength. Because I'm not saying that we overcome these things through ourselves. We are not going to do that. It is through God's grace and strength that we overcome these trials, these temptations and these faults that we have. But Saul, when he was faced with his own shortcomings and when he's faced with the decisions in his life, we're going to see how he did not humble himself. He did not seek the Lord. And he opened the door for Satan because of his hard-headedness, his pride, 
and because of fear. In 1 Samuel 13, we are two years into the reign of King Saul, and all of his men are facing off the gigantic Philistine army. And he's supposed to wait seven days for Samuel to come and sacrifice before he and his men go and fight against the Philistines. But all of his men are scattering, and the prophet Samuel is nowhere to be found. So Saul took matters into his own hands, and he did the sacrifice himself. In 1 Samuel 13, 10 to 13, we read that as soon as he made an end of sacrificing, that Samuel came, and Saul went out to meet him, that he may greet him. And Samuel said, what have you done? And Saul said, because I saw that the people were scattered from me, and you did not come within the days appointed, and the Philistines gathered themselves together at Michmash. Therefore, said I, the Philistines will come down now upon me to Gilgal, and I have not made supplication unto the Lord. I forced myself, therefore, and I offered the burnt soft offering. And Samuel said to Saul, You've done foolishly. You've not kept the commandment of the Lord your God, which he commanded you. For now would the Lord have established your kingdom upon Israel forever. Saul disobeyed in part because of fear. He was afraid of his army scattering and of the Philistines that he was up against and all the circumstances that were surrounding him. And instead of seeking after the Lord and patiently waiting for him, he took matters into his own hands. How many of us have done the same thing or we are currently doing the same thing? We are facing hard circumstances and problems and trials, things that cause fear. And instead of waiting on God and seeking after him, we have decided to take matters into our own hands. But let me tell you right now that I've seen this over and over. Any decision based on fear is the wrong decision. And so when we try to take matters into our own hands and we deal with them using worldly wisdom or our own thoughts. Remember the Bible says, trust not. It says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not unto thine own understanding. So when we rely on our own understanding and the world, it will not lead to good outcomes. In the Old Testament, there was a king named Asa, the King Asa of Judah, who took matters into his own hands and did it his way. And he had negative repercussions because of the way that he chose to go. And we'll read about him later on. Now, King Saul was rebuked for his disobedience, just like God will rebuke us for our disobedience. He rebukes all of his children because he loves them and he wants to keep them on the path of life. And we can all react in one of two ways. We can either humble ourselves and say, Lord, you are right and deliver me, help me, please forgive me. Or we can harden our neck and say, no, and excuse our sins and continue in a path of destruction. Sadly, King Saul chose the latter. He hardened his neck. He did not humble himself. He did not truly repent because he wanted to please his people. And he was full of fear. And he wanted to please his people more than he wanted to please God. And he was afraid of his people more than he feared the Lord. We read of how King Saul was ordered to utterly destroy all the Amalekites along with all their cattle, their goods, their sheep, their spoil. But instead of doing this, Saul preserved the best of everything and he destroyed everything else. And the prophet Samuel said to him, why did you not obey the voice of the Lord? But you flew upon the spoil and you did evil in the sight of the Lord. And Saul said unto Samuel, yay, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord and have gone the way which the Lord sent me and have brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took all the spoil, sheep and oxen, and the chief of the things which should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God in Gilgal. And Samuel responded by saying, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you've rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. And Saul said unto Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord in thy words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Again, we read, I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Now, we know this was not a true repentance from the heart, because we can see it by his future actions. And so, here we see a long history of Saul disobeying God because of greed, fear, 
and the desire to please men. And these decisions of his ended up bringing the wrath of God into his life, and it opened the door for Satan to bring destruction. Remember, an evil spirit ends up coming on to Saul, and so he ends up having to have David called in to play the harp in order to relieve him of this suffering. We too need to ask ourselves, even though it may be very, very painful, am, what about the decisions I am making? Am I making them out of fear? Am I making them out of greed to win people's approval? Am I doing this because it makes my flesh happy? Am I saying or acting this way because I'm afraid of how people may respond or I want them to be pleased in me? Paul says in Galatians 1 verse 10, For if for do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be a servant of Christ. If we're still trying to please men, if we're still trying to gain their approval, then we're not acting as servants of God. If we're trying to please men, isn't that because we don't want to rock the boat or cause offense? Isn't it because we want their friendship? But James warns us this in four Chapter 4, verse 4, he says, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever there will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. And this is what Saul did. He made all of his decisions based off of fear, off of pleasing men, off of pleasing himself, off of being friends with the world, and it turned him into an enemy of God. When Saul faced his problems, his difficulties, his trials, he didn't seek the Lord and bow the knee in humility. Instead, he relied on his own wisdom and his own strength, and he did not do this just once, nor twice, but multiple times. And ultimately, God told him that he would take the throne from him and give it to another. For Samuel fifteen twenty eight says, Samuel said unto Saul, The Lord hath rent the kingdom of Israel from thee this day, and hath given it to a neighbor of thine that is better than thou. At this point, Saul still could have truly repented. He could have humbled himself, given up his crown, and walked away. But he hardened his neck, he hardened his heart, and he clung to power. Sometimes when God brings correction to us, we instead, we cling to what we want. He says, don't buy that. He says, don't marry that person. He says, don't make that decision. Or he says, give up that entertainment. And we harden our head, hearts, and we, we harden our neck, and we do it anyway. And there are negative repercussions. And so Saul, in his whole life through, constantly hardened his heart heart and he lived his life in constant rebellion to God and his plans and sadly I've seen this in people's lives where they once served and loved God but sin crept in and when God corrected them they hardened their hearts and they turned rebellious some of them have committed adultery and not repented of it some of them have turned to a life of immorality and greed and some of them have just given up and then decided to cling to the world instead of taking up their cross and following Jesus and just like we will read of what happens to King Saul these people who turned their back on Jesus, their lives ended up disastrously. And some of these Christians are still saying, I have obeyed the Lord because they've deceived themselves into thinking that their ongoing, unrepentant sins are A-OK -okay in God's sight. But just like in Saul's case, who said he obeyed the Lord, but he did not, these sins, they're not acceptable. In our decisions, in the face of our trials, our hardships, our highs, our lows, and our storms, they can lead to sin and opening the door for death, or they can lead to life and a closer relationship to Jesus. So it's very important how you and I deal with the temptations and the struggles of day to day, of year to year, the ones that we face in our lives, because they can either make us or break us. They can lead us into a closer relationship with Jesus Christ, or they can lead us away from him, away from he who is the way, the truth, and the life, and down that wide, go along to get along self-pleasing, self-seeking path of destruction to hell. In contrast to Saul, though, we read of David, the shepherd boy who God anoints to be the new king. Over and over in the Bible, we read about how David inquires of the Lord in his hardships. And when he faces those hardships, he says, I will trust in the Lord no matter what I may face, no matter how impossible it may look. And so Finally, when Saul is chasing him because he knows David's going to be king one day and Saul's determined to kill him, 
David gets the chance of his life to kill Saul in a cave, but he refuses to. He refuses to take matters into his own hands, unlike Saul, because it will not please God, even though his men, his soldiers underneath him urge him to do so, even though he has to constantly wrestle with the fear of Saul killing him because he got close to it several times. So instead of succumbing to fear like Saul did, and instead of trying to do things through his own strength, and instead of seeking to please his men and his soldiers like Saul again did, he instead, David did, put his trust in God. And he sought to please and obey God above all else. And when Saul leaves that cave, David comes out afterwards and says to him, where did you hear your men saying, Behold, Dave seeks your hurt? Behold, this day your eyes have seen how that the Lord delivered you into my hand in the cave, and some bade me kill you. But mine eye spared thee, and I said, I will not put forth my hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. Moreover, my father, see, see the skirt of my robe in my hand, for in that I cut off the skirt of thy robe, and I killed you not." Know thou, and see that there is neither evil nor transgression in mine hand, and I have not sinned against thee. Yet you hunt my soul to take it. The Lord judge between you and me, and the Lord avenge me of you, but my hand shall not be upon you. As saith the proverb of the ancients, Wickedness proceedeth from the wicked, but mine hand shall not be upon you. Again I say, David, did not take matters into his own hands. He refused to. Instead, he put his life in the hands of God Almighty, and he did not act out of fear. This is in direct contrast with Saul's earlier actions when he decided to do things through his own strength, and he did the sacrifice instead of waiting for God waiting for Samuel and the time when he listened to his soldiers and he spared the king and he kept the best of the cattle from the battle against the Amalekites. But David knew that no matter what he faced, that as he waited on God and trusted in him, he would come through for him. But Saul, Saul refused to wait. He refused to trust. He refused to bend the knee and he refused to obey. How many of us, again, I ask, are making rash decisions because of fear, because we refuse to wait on God's timing? Some of those decisions can be getting married to the wrong person because you're getting older and you're afraid of getting older. And so you refuse to wait. Or that could be buying a house or land because nothing else is showing up and you think you're running out of time. It can also be that we've convinced ourselves that we need to take matters into our own hands because God helps them who help themselves. But let me tell you that this passage is not found anywhere in the Bible. In fact, the Bible says that we are to wait upon the Lord, to trust in him, and that it's not through our own strength, but through his might and power that the battle is won. And so let me tell you that if you do this, if you try to do it through your own strength without seeking the Lord and constantly inquiring of him, that you will get yourself into horrible circumstances and relationships and issues that could have been avoided if you would just have waited and trusted and obeyed no matter what, even if it takes years or a lot longer than you thought. Remember Abraham, he created his own problems by not waiting on the Lord and going into Hagar and having Ishmael. And we do not want Ishmaels in our life. So in the face of decisions, circumstances, problems, and trials, I know this sounds repetitive, but it is only by hearing it over and over that it can truly sink into our spirit. We need to inquire of the Lord. We need to diligently seek after him. And when he gives us his instructions that will never disagree with the word of God, let me tell you that, then we get up and we immediately obey him. Not before and not after a while. In the Bible, we read of how David constantly inquired of God and asked him for instructions to guide him in the path that he should go. And he wholeheartedly trusted that God would answer him. He would come through for him. He would, he would guide him. And then he wholeheartedly obeyed God. In 1 Samuel 28, we read of how David faced two large storms in his life. In the natural 
we read about how the Philistines told David that he was to come and fight against Israel with them because at that time he was living in the land of the Philistines. In the natural, it did not look like David could get out of the situation. If he told them no, King Achish, he most likely would have killed David and all of his men, which weren't that many, for being traitors. On the other hand, if David did go with the Philistines, he would either have to had to fight against his fellow countrymen or against the Philistines while being surrounded by thousands and thousands of them on all sides. The situation did not look good, but David didn't panic. Let me say that again. He did not panic. He waited for the Lord to deliver him. Meanwhile, King Saul is in Israel and this humongous army of Philistines is amassing against him and he does panic. And the Philistines gathered themselves together and came and pitched in Shunem. And Saul gathered all Israel together. And they pitched in Gilboa. And when Saul saw the host of the Philistines, he was afraid. And his heart greatly trembled. And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord answered him not, neither by dreams, nor by Urim, nor by prophets. Then said Saul unto his servants, Seek me a woman that hath a familiar spirit, that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servant said to him, Behold, there is a woman that hath a familiar spirit at Endor. So Saul disguised himself and put on other raiment, and he went, and two men with him, and they came to the woman by night. And he said, I pray thee, divine unto me by the familiar spirit, and bring me him up, whom I shall name unto thee. So first of all, Saul saw this humongous storm before him, the Philistine army, and fear overcame him. His heart trembled within him. Second of all, he did try to go to God and inquire of him and ask him what he should do, but he did it while still in complete disobedience. At this point, he could have repented. He could have humbled himself and said, Lord, I'm wrong. He could have sent for David and handed him the crown. He could have, let me repeat this, humbled himself and repented, but he still refused to do so. And lastly, in the face of his pride and refusing to repent and consumed by fear, he turned to the world for help and guidance. And the Bible says this in Jeremiah 17, verses 5 to 6. Cursed be the man that trusteth in man and maketh flesh his arm and whose heart departeth from the Lord. For he shall be like the heath in the desert and shall not see when good cometh, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness in a salt land and not inhabited. We ourselves need to be careful of turning to the world, of running to them and asking what them what we should do instead of turning and inquiring of the Lord for what we should do in every circumstances, where we send our kids for their education, where we run to for our information. We need to ask ourselves, did I truly search the scriptures with an open, humble heart for how I should handle this? Did I ask God for wisdom, guidance, and understanding? Am I making my decisions based out of convenience, selfishness, fear, greed, pride, rebellion, hard-headedness, personal comfort, worldly wisdom, or because I'm confused? Because if you and I are not turning to God and asking him for help and guidance, if we are trusting in man instead, then we are cursed. The Bible is not, it, it's a promise. He says, this is what happens when you trust in the flesh. We will be cursed and we will be like the heath, which is a shrub in the desert, will be dry, will be broken and brittle and easily shattered when the winds of life come. I've seen many people run to the doctors before they even think about running to God. I've seen children of God read worldly books on how to raise their kids or listen to the world sending, saying you need to send them to public schools so they can get social interaction. And they, they let the world teach them what they should eat, what food groups they should cut out, or how they should handle their situations instead of reading God's word and then humbling themselves, taking it as it is, and obeying it. I myself have times I have tried to dig through what all the health experts say instead of resting in God's truth and His promises for me. It's so easy to vacillate and let doubt come in and then cause you to get confused and you end up on the wrong path. Now, I'm not saying that God can't or won't use certain people and resources to help us, but we must First, inquire of God and ask him to guide our footsteps and he will lead us to the right people if that is the route he chooses for us. 
Because the Bible says, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. So we must ask God for wisdom and trust that he will answer us. James 1 verse 5 says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, which means abundantly, and upbraideth not, which means he won't yell at you or try to correct you or chastise you for wanting wisdom, and it shall be given him. So if we will trust in God, we won't dry and shrivel up and be cursed. Instead, we'll have the next part of Jeremiah 17, verses 7 to 8, where it says, Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord, and whose hope the Lord is. For he shall be like a tree planted by the waters, and that spreadeth out her roots by the river, and shall not see when heat cometh. But her leaf shall be green, and shall not be careful in the year of drought, neither shall cease from yielding fruit. Saul and David, they are excellent examples of this. For Saul, he trusted in the arm of the flesh. He chose to go to a woman with a familiar spirit, and he has her call up the prophet Samuel, and then he hears that he and his soldier, he and his sons, will die on the battlefield. And in 1 Samuel 31, verses 2 to 6, we read that the Philistines did fall hard upon Saul and upon his sons. And the Philistines slew Jonathan and Abinadab and Melchishua, Saul's sons. And the battle went sore against Saul, and the archers hit him, and he was sore wounded of the archers. Then said Saul unto his armor bearer, Draw your sword and thrust me through, lest these uncircumcised come and thrust me through and abuse me. But his armor bearer would not, for he was sore afraid. Therefore Saul took a sword and fell upon it. And when his armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, he fell likewise upon his sword and died with him. So Saul died and his three sons and his armor bearers and all his men that same day together. Unfortunately, Saul and his sons died in battle. And that was all because of his refusal to bend the knee, to bow before the king of kings and to submit himself to God's will. And we read how King Saul falls upon his own sword. And so when he was faced with the storms of life, those trials, those tribulations, he turned to the flesh. And he perished in his pride, his arrogance, his fear, and his rebellion. On the other hand, though, we have the amazing story about how God does deliver David from having to fight against the Israelites. Because the Philistine princes said to the king, there is no way this man is fighting among us. So David gets out of that, and he and his men then head back to their hometown Ziklag. But all of a sudden, he faces an even greater, gigantic storm because they find the city of Ziklag and every last bit of their homes burned to the ground with all their wives, their children, and their animals missing. Could you imagine the absolute fear, the absolute heartache, and the absolute horror trying to overwhelm and overcome David. First Samuel 30 verse 4 says, Then David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and they wept until they had no more power to weep. When David faced this horrible trial, he wept till he could cry no more. So let me tell you, when you go through all these difficult times and when I go through them, there's nothing wrong with crying. It's not ungodly to weep and to pour out our grief before our Lord, before our Abba Father. God understands and he loves us so very much. The Bible says in Isaiah 53, verse 4 to 5, Surely he, Jesus, has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. So Jesus understands and he bears our griefs and our sorrows. And he tells us in Matthew 11, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. When we face trials, don't run away from God in shame, not wanting him to see your hearts hurt, your grief, your tears, or your shortcomings. Instead, go to him and then do what David did after he wept. For Samuel 30 verse 6 reads, And David was greatly distressed, for the people spake of stoning him. They wanted to kill him, because the soul of the people was grieved. Every man for his sons and his daughters. But David encouraged himself in the Lord his 
God. He didn't get angry at God and say, Lord, why did you let this happen? Why did you do this? It was the enemy who did it, not God. Instead, he encouraged himself. And knowing David, most likely that looked like him pulling out his harp or an instrument and starting to sing praises to God. Most likely, he started reminding himself of all the times that God had already delivered him from death, already delivered his soul and come through for him and answered all of his prayers. Psalm 77 verse 11 says, I will remember the works of the Lord. Surely I will remember thy wonders of old. So when we face trials and difficulties, we also need to encourage ourselves in the Lord. I know I have a journal and when God answers prayers or he comes through for me, I write them down and I strongly encourage you. When you have answered prayers, when God comes through for you, when he works in even tiny ways or big ways, Write them all down because you will face other trials and storms and the devil will try to hit you with the depression and hit you with fear and hit you with what well, God doesn't hear your prayers or God can't come through for you or God won't answer you. And then you can open that journal and say, wait a moment, that's a lie of Satan. God, you have come through for me. God, you are awesome. God, you are a shield about me, the glory and the lifter of my head. And so we remind ourselves and we encourage ourselves up in the Lord. Ephesians 5 talks about how we speak to ourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in our hearts to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And James 5 verse 13 says, is any among you a afflicted, let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. So we need to pray to God to pour out our hearts to him. And when we do so, he will strengthen us just like he did for David. The next thing David does right after encouraging himself in the Lord is inquiring of him. He says, Lord, how do you want me to handle this? What should I do? David says to Abiathar the priest, I pray thee, bring me hither the ephod. And Abiathar brought thither the ephod to David. And David inquired at the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, Pursue, for thou shalt surely overtake them, and without fail recover all. So David went, he and the six hundred men that were with him, and came to the brook Besor, where those that were left behind stayed. So David hears, Go. And again, he could have let fear overwhelm him and say, Wait a moment. I only have a small group of men. We could be slaughtered. There's no way I can actually get back my, my wife and my children and, and all of our resources. But instead, he said, I trust in you, God, and I will do what you told me to do. David, he sought the Lord for wisdom. And then stepping out by faith, he obeyed God's instructions for him. And God wants us to do the same thing. He wants us to obey him. Is more than sacrifice, so I will do what you say. Obedience is what you long for from me, more than empty promises. You would have mercy, and I had sacrifice to do justly, and to accomplish with you, God, to seek the bone. Should do I will obey. 
We need to obey God. Even when the circumstances look impossible, even when we're facing insurmountable odds, even if it causes discomfort to ourselves or, or our families, even though it will require us to crucify our flesh and its desires, and even though it may fly in the face of all the worldly wisdom and in the trials and the difficulties we face, we need to also seek the Lord for wisdom, for guidance, for instruction, and we need to step out in faith and obedience, just like David did. And God will reward us. He will bring us through, just like he rewarded David and brought him through because of his trust and his obedience. First Samuel 30, verse 18 and 19 says, David recovered all that the Amalekites had carried away. And David rescued his two wives, and there was nothing lacking to them, neither small nor great, neither sons nor daughters, neither spoil nor anything that had taken that they had taken to them. David recovered all. What a contrast. Saul ends up losing everything. He falls on his own sword and loses his sons, while David puts his trust in God and gets his two wives, his children, and his spoil and everything back and recovers all. And we don't want to be like Saul who perished because of fear and pride. He did not trust God in his hardships. He did not obey him, and he paid the ultimate cost for it. On the other hand, David put his trust in God, even though the road was extremely bumpy, and he was out in the wilderness fleeing from Saul, and then he had to stay and live in the city, in the Philistines' land. Instead, he clung tightly to God's promises. He kept on inquiring of him and obeying him, even as King Saul chased after him year after year, trying to kill him and take his life. And finally, God does reward David for his obedience and his faith by crowning him king of all Israel. And what is even more amazing is that Jesus Christ comes from the lineage of David. What an amazing story of hope, trust, and reward that we still read thousands of years later. And yes, David does mess up later in his life. But when he was rebuked of God, he did not harden his neck. Instead, he humbled himself. He repented and said, Lord, you are right. You are just. And I was the wicked one. And he truly repents from his heart, unlike Saul. And we want our lives to mirror the story of David, one of faith, constant trust, and obedience. And when we fall down and make mistakes, where we humble ourselves, we repent and say, Lord, you are right. And we need to be careful of starting out with a heart on fire for God, of obedience and humility, and then growing lukewarm as we grow older. We need to be cautious of finding ourselves without realizing, starting to go to the world and trusting in them for their information and for their guidance, instead of going to God and trusting in him. We need to be careful that in the face of all the hardships and, and, and the news we are reading, that we're not deciding to take matters into our own hands instead of seeking God's will for our lives. This is something that King Asa, like I mentioned earlier, of Judah did. In his young age, Asa did that which was good and right in the eyes of God. And he took away all the altars and the high places and he broke down the images and he cut down the groves and he commanded Judah to seek the Lord God of their fathers and to do the laws and the commandments. But all of a sudden, there came out against Judah, Zerah, the Ethiopian, with a host of a million men and 300 chariots. And they came unto Mereshah. Then Asa, he went out against him. And they set the battle in array in the valley of Zephatha at Mereshah. And Asa, he cried unto the Lord his God and said, Lord, it is nothing with thee to help, whether with many or with them that have no power. Help us, O Lord our God, for we rest on thee. And in thy name we go against this multitude, O Lord. Thou art God. Let no man prevail against thee. So the Lord smote the Ethiopians before Asa and before Judah. And the Ethiopians, a million man army with 300 chariots, fled. King Asa, in his youth, he sought the Lord and he trusted him, even in the face of this gigantic million man army, which is humongous and more than even King Saul had to face. What faith, what amazing trust. But sadly, as time went on, that faith and that trust and his heart after God 
grew cold. As he grew older and he started relying on his own wisdom and in his own power. And we read in how in his 36th year, the reign, that Basha, the king of Israel, which was Judah's enemy, came up against Judah. And they built Ramah so that they could stop anybody from coming in and going out of Judah. They wanted to stop their trade and they wanted to cut them off and and make their lives miserable and, and try to destroy them. So Asa, in the face of King Basha coming up against him, he brought out the silver and gold from the treasures of the house of the Lord and of the king's house. And then he sent to Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria, that dwelt at Damascus, saying, There is a league between you and me, as there was between my father and your father. Behold, I have sent thee silver and gold. Go, break thy league with Basha, king of Israel, that he may depart from me. And Ben-Hadad hearkened unto king Asa, and sent the captains of his armies against the cities of Israel, and they smote Ejon and Dan and Abalamim and all the store cities of Natali. And so when Basha heard of it, he left off building of Ramah, and let his work cease. Then Asa, king of Judah, came and carried away all the stones of Ramah and the timber thereof, wherewith Basha was building, and he built therewith Geba and Mizpah. Do you already see the difference? That when in the face of this trial that he was coming up against, this time he didn't go to God. He didn't inquire of the Lord. Instead, he was filled with fear, and he relied on his human wisdom. He thought, I've got gold and silver in the temples. I can use them. I can pay these secular armies who know not the Lord and don't praise him and worship idols to come and defend me. Or some of us would say, I've got a credit card. I can deal with my bills using non-existent money. My own family has been there. So I understand that there is an attraction in it. But there are repercussions to those kind of decisions. Sometimes that is just paying off a lot more money over a lot longer period course. So as I said, those kind of decisions where we rely on our own human reasoning, they have the repercussions. Just like Asa's decision right now has repercussions. So Hanani the seer comes before Asa, the king of Judah, and he says to him, because you have relied on the king of Syria and you've not relied on the Lord your God. Therefore is the host of the king of Syria escaped out of your hand. Were not the Ethiopians and the Lubims a huge host with very many chariots and horsemen? Yet, because you relied on the Lord, he delivered them into your hand. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. Herein you have done foolishly. Therefore, from henceforth you will have wars. Then Asa was wroth with the seer, and he put him in a prison house, for he was in a rage with him because of this thing. And Asa oppressed some of the people the same time. And behold, the acts of Asa, first and last, lo, they are written in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel. And Asa, in the thirty and ninth year of his reign, was diseased in his feet, until his disease was exceeding great. Yet in his disease he sought not the Lord but to the physicians. And Asa slept with his fathers and died in the one and fortieth year of his reign. Asa stopped trusting in the Lord. In fact, he took matters into his own hands and when God corrected him and reprimanded him, he got angry. And then he acted rashly and he threw him into jail. How many of us, we've gotten angry at being corrected or reprimanded by either God himself or people he's placed in our life to bring correction? We don't want to be told you did this because of pride or you open the door for the devil and you need to repent and you need to close it or you're doing this because you are doing it for your own glory or the way you responded, arguing, yelling was wrong. But we need to be careful of hardening our hearts because there are repercussions to our actions and God in his loving kindness wants to deliver us from making those wrong decisions which bring about these wrong repercussions. And yes, there are things that are out of our control and that just like David faced that town being burnt down and that was not his fault, but God delivered him from it. But we certainly don't want to be the cause for it. The Bible reminds us that he corrects us because he loves us so very much. Paul says in Hebrews 12, My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when you are rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourges every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement where of all our partakers then are you illegitimate children and not sons 
God corrects us out of love, just like he was correcting Saul and he was correcting Asa. But Asa hardened his heart and instead of repenting, he lashed out in anger. And eventually, when his feet developed a disease, he sought not the Lord, but to the physicians, to the doctors. And he refused to go and inquire of the Lord and put his trust in him. And in his rebellion, he died of a disease because he refused to put his trust in the Lord and to humble himself and to say, I'm please forgive me. I didn't have enough faith. I shouldn't have handled the matter this way. I shouldn't have run to the world to handle the matters. Lord, please forgive me. Now I'm going to run to you. And I pray, Lord, and I thank you for turning it around. We do not want to be constantly suffering in our lives or bring suffering to our children and our, our husbands and our wives because of the rebellion in our hearts, because our actions will also bring about repercussions on the people around us. And we need to humble ourselves, as it says in First Peter 5, 6 to 7, humble yourselves there under them. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Once again, over and over, I'm asking you, how are we handling the storms of life? Are we running to our Abba Father, asking him for strength, for wisdom, for guidance and help? Or are we succumbing to fear? pride and doing as our flesh dictates for if we handle these storms these difficulties as king saul did and king asa in his later years we will be destroyed the bible says in proverbs 29 verse 1 he that being often reproved hardeneth his neck shall suddenly be destroyed and that without remedy we need to run to God in our storms and in our everyday decisions and trials and hards and lows and the actions that we plan on taking. And when we re run to God, we need to be willing to be comforted, corrected, guided and instructed. And we need to obey him and call out to God and say, Lord, help me obey you. God, I know you will bring me through and trust because God will. He will bring you and me through just like he did for David and just like he did for King Asa against that million man army with their 300 chariots. Don't curl up in a ball. Don't give in to fear and live in a place of defeat. Even with the state of the government, even with the state your family may be going through, don't succumb to fear. Don't succumb to heartache and go ahead and cry, but don't let the devil keep you down. Get up, encourage yourself in the Lord, inquire of him and obey him. Run to the arms of our heavenly father, for he will be our shelter. He will be our hiding place and he will grant victory in him. No foe is too great for the Lord to overcome. No circumstance is too impossible for God to overcome and navigate and bring about victory. And no storm is too large for him to calm. Today, we're going to wrap up with this passage in Matthew 4, 38, verses 40. Let's talk about Jesus was in the hinder part of the ship. He was asleep on a pillow and his, his disciples in the middle of this massive storm that all of a sudden comes upon them, they wake him and they say unto him, Master, do you not care that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind and he said unto the sea, peace, be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. And he turned around and he said to them, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? No matter what giant we may face in our lives, no matter what storm may be on the horizon in front of us or whipping about us right now, have faith in God, in Jesus. Run to him, put your trust in him, humble yourself because God says peace. Be still, hide yourself under the shadow of his wings. And if you have hardened your heart like King Saul or King Asa in his later years, it is not too late to repent. Don't listen to the devil says you have committed the, the, in, the unforgivable sin because if there's any conviction, any desire in your heart to come back to your Abba Father, that means there's hope for you. Repent and return to the arms of Jesus. me you used to talk and walk right beside me we used to spend all our time together but now those days are gone now when i call you never answer 
your ears are closed, your heart cold and distant. You say you're sorry, but life gets in the way, and now you have no time. Return to me, return to me, return to your first love. Remember, remember the days we My heart breaks as I watch you stumble. I feel your pain. I see you in your strongholds. I only wait for you to call out to me. But still, you stay silent. Return to me. Return to me. Return to your first love. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father God, I thank you for this message, a message of correction, a message of warning, and also a message of hope that says, Lord, that if we turn from you, there is destruction, but if we turn to you, there is great blessings, there is redemption, there is hope, and there is victory. And I thank you, Lord, for revealing to us in our lives those areas where we have not turned to you or we've hardened our neck. And help us to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God that we may be exalted in due time. And I thank you for this. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <laughs>